Good day, my name is Ben Vogler, and today we'll be discussing uh, observability with Console Connect. Um, but first, before we start moving into directly into to service meshes, we need to build up slowly to how we used to do stuff to how we want to do stuff now. Um, back in the days when you wanted more compute power, you would have to get management buy-in, you would need to raise money, you would have to get a new purchase order, uh, you would have to order the thing, the thing would eventually show up to your your uh, loading bay, you would have to install it, you would have to um, install the OS, and then you would have new OS. Um, eventually, that would mean, like as in this picture, the damn things were big. Um, so it would require building new rooms or new buildings. Um, that wasn't that so easy. So it took years to get new compute. In the 90s, when the first internet bubble happened, uh, we were at a point where we would, instead of building new computers, we try to solve our problems in such a way that we could spread it across multiple servers. Um, when I was still in the lab, that's how we used to do stuff. And uh, the list of servers was fairly small. The list of users was fairly small. So we could just say, you work on server one, you work on server two, or this happens to be there and there. Um, when we started to connect stuff to the internet and our users weren't internally anymore, um, things like load balances were introduced. Um, this way we could assign a, a vanity URL like google.com to our load balancers. And then we could tell our users that's where it goes. And then the load balancers works out where uh, how to a how to spread the load or uh, where stuff is um, that was fine when purchasing was still slow like in the 90s you'd still have to raise um, a purchase order you would still have to wait for stuff to show up on the loading dock and you would have to install it in your, your own data center so um, adding new new nodes and adding them to a static list in the load balancer was fine because that's how slow things were. It was actually a manageable job. But when we started moving to the cloud, um, adding new nodes, removing new nodes, adding new services became much, much quicker. And that's when service discovery showed, showed up. And that's um, basically what service discovery is. It's a method of announcing yourself into a cluster or a pool and saying, I am service X or B in this case, and I am ready for action. And then the load balancer you announce yourself to the node balancer and the node balancer starts assigning you work. And that's where uh, console comes in. That's how it originally was envisioned as a service discovery tool that could basically route stuff to your uh, to your, your networks or your clusters. Uh, how do we set up a service in console? It's actually fairly simple. Uh, it's a file on disk. Um, it's written in a DSL called HCL, the HashiCorp uh, configuration language. And um, here it shows as such, we have a service name counting and it runs on a local port 9003 and it has one health check. Um, basically, it, and it pings uh, the slash health endpoint every one second. And if it's healthy, it gets announced as such into the cluster and it is accepting work. If it's no longer healthy, console will take it out of the cluster and until such time that it's fixed again. Uh, console is, uh, you can not only ask console direct questions, console can also act as a DNS server. So it actually lives in your old school um, platform or environment, just ever, like, uh, like everybody else, all your services. And you can dig it on a local port 8600, and there you need to ask it a, a, a DNS question in a specific way. If I want service counting, then it's counting.service.console. Um, and you can even incorporate this into your existing DNS services. And like I show here for my bind server, there is a console zone that forwards all the questions that for services and then dot console to my local uh, console server. And then um, uh, the cloud was fast. Kubernetes containers was even faster. Instead of minutes, we now start can start and stop services in seconds. Um, we can run services across multiple clouds. Um, and that brought a whole new layer of questions and problems to solve. And that's where service meshes came in. This is where we start to think about how do services collaborate or interact? And how can I distinguish between different services or how can I block access to different services? And that's where um, 
console grew into console connect and that's console connect is where the lovely people at HashiCorp incorporated or grew the service mesh level of um of console and that's what we're going to discuss in the next couple of slides so how do i extend um my service definition um for a service to become console connected or service mesh aware and that's fairly simple we need to add just a little st connect stanza with some empty um, uh, other stanzas uh, and that's it now it's console uh, console connect it um, has a tls certificate and it's ready for action so how do i connect to this it doesn't we have a accounting service, which was our backend. Now we'll add a dashboard on top of it, runs on port 9002. The only thing we need to add is a similar connect stanza, but now we declare uh, our upstream. So we're basically saying we want to um, use another service. And the service in this case is called counting and bind it on a local port 5000. Why this is cool, we're going to discuss in the next couple of slides. Uh, first, we need to fire up the connections. So we need to tell console um, that the connect side of things need to be started. And that's fairly simple. It's a command line uh, command called console connect proxy. And then you basically say for service counting and for service dashboard, let's, let's give me a sidecar and basically make it uh, connect aware. Um, this is very cool. It brings us a couple of additional features that we want. Um, Remember, I mentioned we bind it to a local port 5000. So when we use service discovery, we no longer need the vanity URL of a service, but we still need to know which port it's bound to. And if people bind it, if it's a known service that binds to its known port, then I can infer it and I can still similarly use it. Um, if you start using things like Kubernetes, HashiCorp's Nomad as a scheduler, stuff might not run on its uh, predefined port. It might be on a random number. Um, so we need to either make um, rules about which port to use, or we need to have a ledger of what the port to use. And that's basically what console does for us. And instead of using, trying to work out a way to ask console for that port, console connects actually says no. I know I'll work out the port, but bind it to a local port. So for your local application, it will look just like it is connecting to a local hosting and console connect does the magic below. The other great feature about console connect is ACLs or in console speak intentions. So I, I can either I can I can block services from connect from um, using my service, I can allow stuff to you to happen. So we never get into a situation where our um, development database connects, tries to connect to our, uh, no, sorry, our development platform starts to connect to our production database or vice versa. Um, that should definitely never happen. You should run a console cluster for your development uh, platform. You should run a console server for your production platform because Heaven forbid if that ever happens due to copy and paste uh, um, error. You can use um, all the stuff I've discussed now in previous slides. You can actually try yourself. Uh, the lovely people at HashiCorp have a very good tutorial to follow. Uh, that brings us to observing stuff. So I've used the words uh, console abstracts the magic away uh, for you. Um, I've only, I've also used a, uh, I've carried a pager for the last 10 years and abstracting magic is, uh, scares me because, uh, I will never want to end up in a situation where restart and pray is my only way out of a uh, problem. So luckily, um, the lovely people at HashiCorp have ways to work, to work out what is going on. And that's actually what we need to do in general anyway. So. There's three ways to work out what is going on. We either look at the metrics that a, um, a system emits. So how many purchases are happening? How, what's, uh, how many uh, concurrent users do I have? How, what's, what's the hit rate per second? Um, also, can I look at the logs the platform is emitting? How many errors are, are, are there? Are there information messages? And also, since we're using, well, hopefully, or 
possibly using microservices, you also need to look at traces. And tracing is basically working out where in your platform your application is spending its time. Is it in the database? Is it um, rehashing ACLs? Is it waiting for the accounting service that is waiting for its own database? Um, so the three things that we need to look at is metrics, traces, and logs. And the rest of this uh, presentation is going to dig into how we're going to use the Grafana stack or the um, to look at into where the magic is happening in Console Connect. So Console Connect is um, built on the shoulder of giants. So it's not a, a, a novel implementation, but it's actually reusing a CNCF tool called Envoy, which is great because there's more people looking at it. It's not a not invented here a product, but it's actually a nice wrapper around, around Envoy. So when we I talk about metrics, I'm talking about Prometheus collecting your um, exposed metrics. Prometheus is a CNCF tool. It, um, it scrapes metrics, as I said. So instead of the classic old school tools that push in a, a metrics, it actually pulls metrics. That brings in um, the need for service discovery, which we have, and is very cool uh, and nicely integrated into Prometheus. Prometheus also has its own uh, query language that allows us to um, query the data, but also ask very, very specific questions. So how do I expose my Prometheus metrics um, in Console Connect. And I'd actually, I'm not exposing Console Connect console metrics, we, although you also should, but um, this way we're actually exposing the built-in Envoy metrics, which is very cool. And we, the only thing we need to do is add a three-line blob to our already existing um, Console Connect a configuration basically saying I'm, I want to inject a little bit of configuration and I want to make sure that um, I expose my Envoy Prometheus endpoint at a certain uh, port in uh, on my local system. Um, that the way I showed it in the previous slide is actually a bit cumbersome because now we need to actually make a promise. Well, I need to ask all our developers in every job you you may make sure that this line is available. The other way around is um, injecting it into the global console configuration. And by basically saying, enable the central service config and make sure that uh, for every type, every kind of, pro, uh, of a proxy, we, um, we inject this, uh, this bind address. And of course, as I said, please make sure that you're exposing the console metrics itself, and that's the last four lines. Basically, I have a, a telemetry blog and make sure you configure if you expose it as Prometheus data. Uh, how to collect this in Prometheus? There's two ways. Uh, one is a hard coded list, which is the top part, um, which is a little bit of YAML, and you say have a scrape config. That's the, the way of Prometheus names those things to have a job and scrape all the uh, static targets. Now, it's in the, the cool meta way of doing it, uh, cooler meta way of doing it is actually using console service discovery. So have Prometheus query console for all services that have a certain name, in this case, console connect uh, envoy, and then make sure that you just um, scrape those. That way we actually announce services that need to be scraped by Prometheus and then the circle is round. So how do we use uh, Prometheus data? There's two ways, actually console has a UI and since version 1.7, you can actually have a nice uh, integration with Prometheus. And in the general console uh, configuration, you need to add a UI config blob and you need to point that um, towards your, your Prometheus um, server and that's it. Then if you look at the UI, you now have a little exploratory usage um, view if you drill down into your services. In this case, I have a product, a product API that needs to talk to my database and I can actually see data going on. That's all it shows, but if you want to drill deeper, you actually can click on open the metrics dash dashboard and then what happens? It goes to your local Grafana instance. And Grafana is a dashboard that does metrics and does metrics in a very generic, uh, general way. It started out as a project that could visualize graphite data. Um, 
but over the years it's, it's gained a plugin system and it, it gained data backend plugins for basically any um, metrics backend, but also logging uh, and tracing at the moment. So it's very cool. How do we connect Grafana to our Prometheus? It's a little YAML file uh, with a standard blob uh, of type Prometheus pointed to uh, DNS where Prometheus lives in my case, that's the console service. So console also does DNS for this. And uh, I'll do it in a wildly insecure way by not having any authentication. If you run in the production, please add it. But for this uh, presentation itself. Uh, then in Grafana, I can use a bunch of cool um, dashboards. You can also download them off of the Grafana website. And in this case, I actually have a visualization of my console cluster. I have three nodes. There's a leader, and I have a fairly healthy amount of queries going on. Next up is logs. Um, I'm introducing a tool called Loki, which came out of Grafana Labs uh, fairly recently. And in the byline is uh, Prometheus for logs. So in the olden days, or not that long ago, actually, um, logging aggregation systems like the Alk stack, like Splunk, were platforms in and of itself. So it, it took skills, time, resources to run that just for your actual platform to push stuff into. So Loki is a much simpler way, but also a much more powerful way, in my opinion, of doing stuff. It's um, it's heavily influenced on, on Prometheus, um, and you can run it basically off of a single Go binary as a monolithic uh, instance, or you can spread it out as microservices, all using the same binary. Um, how do I push my stuff from? Um, from my console connect into Loki, I, there's a couple of ways doing this. The first one is if you're running everything in Docker anyway or in Kubernetes, um, install the Docker plugin um, they Grafana provide. And there are some issues at the moment, so it's a blocking call. So if your Loki is down, you'll have issues manipulating your containers. If you're running still bare metal or if you're a bit scared about the blocking uh, query thing, is you can actually make console connect write its logs into a file and then scrape it using the Loki's command line tool called Promptail. And the weird ish command line on, on line number one is um, so we have the, the first part of the command is the command we're used to. And then dash dash, which means it tells console everything after this is not your configuration, but it's Envoy. So it, you can parse stuff directly to Envoy. And this is how you, this is how we now ask Envoy to um, parse everything to a config file, which then gets scraped and pushed into Loki. Um, again, how do I set up the data source similar like before? YAML file of the. Um, and then type Loki, put, push it towards the URL, and then uh, Bob's your uncle. What does that look like? If you want to initially, you want to do exploratory research, um, what isn't my application actually pushing? What are his neighbors pushing? Therefore, Grafana has a very cool um, new explore tool. And then we can query. You can push, push in any LogQL queries that uh, you can come up with. And then eventually you can turn that into dashboarding. Last, lastly, it's um, traces. Traces um, can be stored in a new tool called Grafana Tempo, which has a similar impetus as, as Loki. Uh, the generation one tools like Zipkin, like Jaeger, actually are quite cumbersome to run. You require databases, you require storage. And Tempo is a much leaner way of running things, but not stopping you um, running your own platforms. It's a single Go binary. It speaks uh, Zipkin, uh, Jaeger, OpenTelemity um, dialects, so you can use your, your tools you're used to, but in a much leaner way. And then it stores it directly into cloud cloud based storage instead of a database you have to run. Um, making Envoy emit traces is a bit more work than than logs or metrics. So there's a two way two way blob. One's 
of JSON, you, firstly, you need to uh, tell uh, Envoy that it needs to emit Zipkin or in this case, Zipkin type um, traces. Um, and then next of all, that's the more elaborate blob that hopefully HashiCorp will eventually abstract away for us. It's, there's a large blob that basically has a three line bits of information. Where's the address? What port uh, is my, uh, my Zipkin or in my case, uh, my tempo living? And please push the traces to that. Um, again, we can simply add it to, um, to Grafana, my little YAML file pointed towards the tempo query um, front end. Uh, tempo at the moment needs a second component um, to, visual, to visualize traces in Grafana. Um, they're in the process of removing this requirement so that you simply only have tempo. Um, but for the moment, it's a, manip a slightly manipulated um, Jaeger front end that needs to run. So hopefully when 0 0.7 comes out, which hasn't happened yet at the time of this recording, you will be able to run this as a single uh, single binary. Um, if we have uh, tempo traces, we can set up it in such a way that we can correlate between low key sources and tempo sources. And therefore, we need to um, extend the low key data source slightly by saying uh, there's now the derived field, or if you find the derived field that smells like trace ID, then couple it to, um, then it probably is a trace ID, and make sure that you couple it to, to the tempo data source. So what does that look like? If you, on the left, uh, we're, we're looking at, at logs, and if it finds a trace ID, then there's a new button you can click, and then on the right-hand side, a trace panel shows up. So therefore, we can very easily and simply correlate between our logs and our traces. And hopefully, you can work out what happens. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Uh, if you want to talk to me about it, ping me on email. Uh, you want to stalk me on Twitter, please do. And if you want to look at these slides a bit more slowly, then you can find them on SlideShare.